Getting the signal, we're going to go ahead and kick this off. Uh, thank you all for coming. We are surprised that so many of you are here so late on Friday, but we appreciate it. Hopefully, this will be at least entertaining. Um, thank you for coming to the SIG Auth deep dive session. We're going to give you an overview of some stuff we've already done, some stuff we're planning to do, and then uh, we're going to look at some exploratory work that we're doing. Uh, my name is Jordan Liggett. I'm one of the tech leads for SIG Auth. work with a lot of people I see here. Uh, on the slide, or in the original uh, meeting, Mo Khan was supposed to be here. He couldn't make it, but instead we have... Hey, uh, I'm Manish. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I'm a member of Kubernetes SIGAUTH and uh, maintainer for Secrets for CSI Driver. And I'm Rita. I am SIGAUTH and Microsoft. And with that, thank you for being here on such a late Friday afternoon. <laughs> so first, let's kick off with some graduated features. Uh, all right, so the first one that we have stru structured authorization config, uh, Jordan, Nabrun, and Rita, myself, <laughs> worked on that. Um, so the idea behind this feature is instead of using uh, CLI flags for your Cube API server, now you have a single configuration file that you can actually uh, define multiple webhooks, uh, and the config file can be reloaded without any restarting of your API server. Um, and you can actually provide customization f around what the um, authorization looks like, specifically customize webhook, uh, timeout, and uh, failure policies. Uh, and then we also have cell match conditions uh, to scope what type of conditions actually requires a, a a request to be called to, to call a webhook. Uh, and some of these examples are you know, a denied webhook at the front of the authorization chain, as you can see, uh, and then uh, in front of a standard node and RBAC authorizer, uh, and then a, short, a super short timeout, uh, a deny policy if errors are encountered, um, and then using cell match conditions to scope to a specific namespace and exam that system controller so that an outage of the webhook that isn't going to create uh, any issues to the cluster. Uh, and then a second allow webhook uh, at the end of your authorization chain uh, can also have some uh, timeouts as well as um, failure policy. Um, obviously, there's uh, also a link at the bottom where you can check out a previous demo that Lega did uh, in 2023. Really cool demo. And the, uh, the slides and links are all uploaded, so uh, feel free to check those out and you can follow those later. Uh, next, we have a, a structure authentication config. Um, similarly, uh, and this is a feature that Anish and Mo worked on, uh, and similarly, we want to take the responsibility from the flags so that you can add a lot more customization with a configuration file. And, and again, this is a, a config file that you can reload without restarting the server. Uh, and a lot of really awesome op uh, options that you can provide. Uh, example being multiple JOT authenticators, uh, being able to uh, support multiple identity providers, uh, except multiple audiences, as you can see, uh, for the same authenticator. Uh, and it can also extract data from your JOT token for authentication. Uh, and then your identity provider uh, that don't support uh, OpenID Connect Discovery can also be supported. And once again, we have cell expression that can be used to extract uh, user attributes from the claims. Uh, and as you can see from this example, um, append to join or split claims and set other extra user attributes. Uh, and the cell expression can also be used to verify extracted user attributes are acceptable. Next, we have another really cool feature called uh, label field uh, selector authorization. Uh, David and Jordan worked on this, um, and this is a new feature that allows you to create more finer grain authorization based on labels and field selectors. Um, and this, again, allows webhook authorizers in the future uh, to allow lists, watch, requests 
providing that the requests actually use labels uh, and field selectors. Uh, for example, um, it is now possible for uh, you to create an authorizer to say, hey, if uh, the user, uh, this user cannot list all pods unless um, the no name matches some specific value, right? Um, and then also uh, another example is uh, allow a user to watch all secrets in a namespace that are not labeled as, say, confidential equal to true or something like that. Very excited. Um, another really cool feature is um, actually exposing no information in service account tokens. Uh, Mo and James worked on this feature, uh, and since 1.30, uh, Kubernetes version 1.30, uh, the information from your node is actually included in the token issued to the pot, uh, and th those user attributes are surfaced uh, when the token is used to authenticate to the API server, uh, to the API. Uh, this actually means that authorization and admission components can see that information and restrict requests uh, based on the node of the pod the credential is issued to and whereby, again, restricting access uh, for what the node uh, can access. Uh, and then there's actually another talk or earlier this week uh, called Squashing Trampling uh, Pots, uh, as, uh, and then the demo for that is uh, included in that link. Uh, Thank you for that demo. <laughs> uh, another graduated feature is called restricted anonymous authentication. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Vignac worked on this particular feature. And, and um, so ideally, anonymous access could be uh, completely turn off, but as we all know, sometimes that's pretty hard because there are special needs and with very, very narrow specific use cases. For example, um, health Z are, is for load balancing, live Z is for health check, and cluster information. So there are cases where you do need to enable anonymous access. So with this new feature, it basically allows you to tightly control um, how you want to specify specific endpoints so that um, you know, we don't make a mistake, uh, maybe a bad copy paste uh, that I could actually end up opening up anonymous access to your whole cluster. Uh, and with this, uh, it will pr prevent uh, uh, protect against accidental uh, broad authorization. All right. So that's, that's what we've been busy working on over the past year. And I want to talk about some of the things that we are working on now that will be coming up in the next year. Uh, <clears throat> and as we go, we're trying to put the names of the people who are working on these just so you get a sense of how many different people are involved in these. Sometimes it's the same suspicious crew of characters. but. Uh, we really do have a lot of people chipping in to help with these. Um, so Tahir uh, worked on these two. Uh, the first is the idea of a cluster trust bundle. If you've ever needed to distribute CA routes to your pod, uh, you've probably been forced to put them into a config map and then copy that config map into every namespace and then mount that into pods. Uh, that's what we do for the CA bundle for talking back to the Cube API server. Uh, and it's OK. It's not terrible, but it's, it's a little fiddly, and it's tough to keep that synced across all namespaces. Uh, and so this is, this is a first class way to do that. Um, it connects to the idea of the signer name that's already in the certificate signing request API. So this uh, is giving a first class way to distribute the CA routes for signers. Uh, and then a corresponding feature to be able to mount those into pods. The second feature is pod certificates, uh, which to here is also working on. Uh, which would allow pods to request a certificate from a given signer and have that certificate be issued and then mounted into the pod. And so these are sort of generic mechanisms for distributing trust and generic mechanisms for distributing identity certificates, which could be used for all kinds of creative things, I'm sure. The next feature that is in progress is something called external service account token signing. Uh, to here, uh, worked on this, but uh, Harshal is a, a new person to our community. He hasn't done a lot upstream. We're excited to have him help with this. Uh, and the idea is to externalize the signing. So right now, when the uh, API server issues a token, it does that using private key files that it holds locally. And so the API server has the signing material available to it. It can make the token and issue it. Uh, this optionally lets you replace that local signer with a call out to a gRPC API, which 
uh, lets you remove access to signing material from the Kube API server. It lets you delegate that signing to some external, possibly more trusted signer, like a cloud KMS, uh, or lets you at least have auditability that a signature of a token happened. Uh, and so the, that's on the signing side. On the other side is getting the set of public keys that you use to verify tokens. And that also is part of this API. So externalizing the signing and externalizing the way you get public keys to verify tokens. And a nice sort of side property of externalizing the public key bit is that you can now get those dynamically. So if you're doing a key rotation, uh, you can fetch the keys regularly and get the new keys without restarting your server and distribute them from some external external point. We're excited to see this happen. This uh, just merged in alpha, uh, so it will be able to be used in beta or stable, hopefully next year. Next feature is fine-grained kubelet authorization. So the kubelet has an API, which some people know and some people don't. Uh, and the way authorization was set up for that API uh, was that it carved out a few specific things like uh, health and uh, metrics and logs, and pretty much everything else got put in a bucket because we really only expected the Cube API server to be talking to the Kubelet API. And so fine-grained authorization didn't really matter if the only client was this one main highly privileged client anyway. Uh, but there are actually scenarios where you have node local agents that want to check things like the configuration or health or inspect running pods. And it was unfortunate that to let those things work, you had to give them unfettered access to the whole Kubelet API. And so uh, Vinayak also is working on a feature to um, allow access just to those specific names, uh, endpoints uh, without overgranting permissions. So we're excited to see that happen. <laughs> The next uh, feature, uh, Standa and Abu worked on this one. Um, who here has seen a bit flip happen in etcd? Uh, where you write something to etcd and suddenly, like, instead of API version and kind, it's like APJ version and kind. Yeah. Um, cosmic rays are weird, and they really do happen, and the failure mode is pretty horrific. Uh, as soon as that happens to one of your objects in etcd, that entire resource type becomes unlistable. Uh, and if you can even manage to figure out which specific object went bad, the way you recover from that is also really bad. You have to go do surgery talking directly to etcd. Um, so that was one, one case where we saw this. Another case is if you're using something like uh, storage encryption, and there's a human accident, and you actually removed a, a key needed for decryption before you had fully uh, migrated all of the data encrypted with that. Accidents happen. Again, the, recovery, the failure mode was just horrific, and the recovery was very painful as well. And so uh, this feature allows explicit uh, force deletion with appropriate highly high, high permissions, explicit force deletion of corrupt objects um, to allow recovering from scenarios like this. Hopefully, you never encounter those. But if you do, at least there will be a path forward for you. The next set of features that I'm, I'm really excited about, who here knew that once an image is pulled to a node, even if it required pull secrets, credentials to pull from the registry, once it's on the node, any pod on the node can use that image by default. Who knew that? OK, maybe a th third of us. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's been disappointing for 10 years. There were workarounds to that. There's an in-tree admission plugin you can turn on called Always Pull Images, which basically forces every pod to always do an image registry ping every time it tries to start. That gets around this issue, but then it causes other issues, like your image registry is now in the critical path, and an outage there can mean your pod can't spawn new replicas on that node. Uh, the workarounds weren't great. And so Standa has been working on uh, a way to keep track of which credentials successfully were used to pull images. And then if new pods show up that haven't proven that they should have access to an image that required credentials, uh, they have to prove themselves. So on first attempt, first use of an image by a pod with unproven credentials, it'll ping the registry, and after that, it'll get to use it without, uh, re -put, uh, without putting the registry in the crit uh, critical path. 
The second feature uh, related to image pulls, uh, Anish and Mo have been working on this. Uh, right now, when a pod has to authenticate to an image registry, there are only two options. One is it uses static credentials that live in Kubernetes secrets, which either you take responsibility for rotating or more realistically are just super long lived. Um, that's one option. The other option is something the cluster administrator sets up that's node wide that has no idea of the pod that's using an image. It's just told, please give me a credential to pull an image. I don't know who this is for. Uh, and so this enhances that credential plugin API to give more context about the pod and the service account specifically that the image is being pulled for. And so it can do things like uh, pass through a service account token for registries that are Kubernetes aware and can make use of that, or do a token exchange where a service account, a token is exchanged for some provider specific token using some mapping that the plugin determines. So this is gonna allow us to um, have shorter lived tokens, better scoped image pull credentials, uh, and we're excited about seeing that. Now we're into the InDesign uh, features. Uh, remember we said that node claims inside tokens were sort of the foundation for future work we want to do about bounding service account permissions. This is one of those features. So uh, we've done a lot of work with node restriction and node authorization to keep the kubelet identity itself as constrained as we can, to keep it from escaping to other nodes. But as soon as you have a daemon set that schedules pods out on every node and runs with a service account, and you give that service account super broad permissions, well, now every node in your cluster has access to credentials that it can use to escape. And so, so it sort of undoes some of that work. And uh, we've seen people struggle with this. Some people just end up over granting stuff to daemon sets anyway. Some people try to be clever and like, well, we'll have this daemon set mount in the kubelet credentials and use that instead to stay constrained. It's just, it, it's been difficult. And so we're trying to think about how we can use node information inside service account tokens to opt into service accounts that are restricted to sort of the footprint of their nodes permissions. Uh, there's some tricky issues around this. Um, you've got daemon sets wanting to do things the node can do anyway, so that's fine. You've got service accounts wanting to do things that the node can't do, but aren't, uh, won't let you move between nodes. And if you know that's what's happening and you want to grant it anyway, that could be fine. But how to express that is a little tricky. So this is in design. If you're interested, uh, talk to Vinayak or me or look for uh, discussions of this in the SIG meetings. Uh, this last one I wanted to talk about is sort of a tweak to some of the certific certificate validation we already do. When the Cube API server talks to a node, it already uses standard TLS verification of the serving certificate that the kubelet presents, which is fine. Uh, but that's typically IP or DNS name validation. And in environments where nodes can cycle in and out rapidly and maybe IP addresses can be released and reallocated rapidly, uh, we would like to do a little bit more uh, to make sure that we're actually talking to the node we think we're talking to. And so this is, this is a relatively small design. Uh, I think this will go pretty quick. Uh, but it's uh, doing additional checks on the TLS certificates when we talk to nodes, uh, just to strengthen our guarantee that we're talking to the right node. And with that, I want to hand it off to Anish, who's going to talk about some of the secret store work. Okay, so so far we talked about all the caps. Uh, the secret store CS, uh, sync controller is actually a new SIGOT subproject. Uh, this was derived from the existing subproject, which is called secret store CSI driver. Uh, we have an optional sync feature in the driver, which is not ideal. So we basically came up with the design. Uh, we worked with everyone in SIGOT, and finally we spun it off as a separate controller. Uh, so right now the controller lives in Kubernetes SIGs. Uh, Nilek worked on the alpha release for this one. Uh, and the goal is basically to use the existing providers that we support for the CSI driver. Um, we use the same RPC, like the same communication that we do between driver provider. We use that for the controller provider as well. Um, right now it's in alpha. Uh, we're working towards the beta milestone. And for beta, basically we're working on the rotation support. So anytime a secret changes in your external secret store, we will automatically update the Kubernetes secret. And then in addition to that, we're doing, uh, we're also adding metrics and then performing load testing to make sure that this can handle load. Uh, once the controller reaches beta upstream, uh, we have a plan to deprecate the sync as Kubernetes 
feature in the driver, and then I think once the controller reaches stable, we will come up with a way to completely remove the feature from the driver. Okay, so we have covered the keps that have already graduated in Sigoth, and then also the keps that are currently ongoing. Uh, in the title for this talk, if you had looked at it, there was another thing which Mo had put in, which was maybe RBAC++. Plus plus. So we're entering that part of the talk, which is gonna be brief. Uh, so first thing is user stories for authorization. So here are some of the user stories that we want to explore and cover. So basically it's allowing nodes to list pods scheduled to them. While this is already handled by the node authorizer, it cannot currently be expressed in a generic manner. And then for example, if you have a custom resource with a field that matches the node name, how can you ensure that the node agent can only list subset of the custom resource relevant to that node it's scheduled on? Similarly, consider a scenario where a controller needs to list only a specific type of resource. So these type of restrictions could also extend to other use cases, such as applying field selectors to secrets. And then expanding on this, it could be valuable to support uh, field selector, label selectors on secrets. For instance, you might want a dynamic control mechanism where a user can only list secrets labeled with their username. And this would require referencing attributes dynamically across resources and roles. Uh, these are the user stories and problems that we've been considering to address. Uh, throughout these changes, maintaining uh, strict backward compatibility is critical. So we need to ensure that the older API servers continue to process requests as expected without any unintended behaviors. So all of these can already be done in some way or form using webhook authorizers, but what if you want a declarative way to do this? So that is where RBAC++, totally an experimental thing. I would say it's pre-pre-alpha, like we're just looking at it. Uh, so the approach that we're exploring is conditional RBAC, effectively. Uh, what I mean by conditional is, in a sense, very similar to what exists today, uh, but today, but it's just more dynamic. So you could say that a cluster role binding is conditional on the user that they can apply to, and a role binding is conditional on the user and then the intersection of both the users and the namespace it resides in. So there are sort of two dimensions of conditionality that exist today. Uh, you can scope it down to either the user or user and the namespace. And then there is a smaller, so there, there are a small set of dimensions that are made available today. The idea is to make more dynamic dimensions available and the design that we are exploring and the POC is uh, leaving the cluster role as is, and then assume you don't need this level of fanciness in case of role bindings. And then this leaves us with cluster role binding and making that conditional. So right now in the POC, we are calling it conditional uh, cluster role binding. And it's basically a different way to bind cluster roles at cluster scope, but in addition, having a bunch of cell expressions that get evaluated before you uh, do it. Uh, so this is the gist of the proposal, and then what I'm gonna do is show you how the API looks like right now. Uh, basically, the cluster roles remains exactly the same. As a user, you define a cluster role saying, hey, I wanna have secrets, and then get and list, and then there is a new resource called the conditional cluster role binding, um, and then if you look at it, basically this cluster, conditional cluster role binding references the cluster role name uh, via a new field. And then in addition to that, there are a list of conditions that need to evaluate it true before this cluster role gets activated. And in here, for this example, basically this is an example where you want to constrain a controller can list all secrets of a particular type. Um, and then so the first expression is basically saying, hey, if the request user matches Bob, and then we are further constraining to say if it matches only field selectors. So basically a type equal to my type. So this particular user Bob can list secrets of uh, this particular field. And when both these conditions evaluate to true, then basically the user can list those secrets. Then here's an example on how you could do this with label selectors on secrets. So a similar expression, which is to say user Bob, but in addition to that, you can also use the label selectors and say, if a secret has my label equal to my value, 
then this particular user Bob is allowed to list secrets of those type. And then uh, this is an example on how you could use regular expressions and say a particular user can access namespaces that start with a particular prefix. And here the example that we're doing is prod hyphen, so a Bob user can access namespaces prod one, prod two, and so on, right? And then an interesting example here that we have is around what nodes can list. Um, basically, the first expression here is checking the prefix and asserting the name is not just a prefix, so it's asserting that the object that's making the request is actually a node. And then it is also asserting that this particular node belongs to the group, system nodes. Uh, and then in the last expression, it's basically checking that the one that it's listing, the node name matches where, whichever our node is requesting it. So basically we are uh, tightening that in the third condition. So this is a quick overview of the experimental API. And then I have a cluster uh, which has this. So when you do k get cl conditional cluster role binding, basically I have applied all the conditional cluster roles uh, that are the role bindings that I shared in the previous one. So if I do, okay. So this is the example from the namespaces that, that have a particular prefix, right? And so what we had allowed was the user Bob is allowed to access anything with prod hyphen. So if I do kubectl get secrets, no error. I can, if there are secrets in that namespace, then I can get it. Similarly, if I do prod two, that works. Uh, but as user Bob, now if I try to access secrets in dev namespace, then it basically says you're not allowed to do that. And then similarly, if we look at Okay, so this is the one with the label selector. So in the label selector, we said anyone with Bob uh, is allowed to list secrets that have this particular label, which is my label equal to my value. So when I do that, it, the conditional policy allows me to do it. But if I try anything else, uh, then it basically says, no, you're not allowed to do that. And then the last thing is with the field selectors. Okay. so. In the field selector, if I try a type that I'm not allowed to, basically it'll error out. But in this case, if I do the my type that is allowed by the conditional uh, uh, binding, then it'll work. Uh, so this is a quick demo of what we're thinking. And so far what we've done is we have presented this in the SIGOT meeting, uh, which was two weeks before the KubeCon. We got a lot of good feedback from David, Jordan, and other folks on the call. Uh, so we're going to continue working on a newer version of the API uh, to address those comments. Uh, but if this is anything that interests you or if you have user scenarios that could fit in this, uh, feel free to reach out to us or like join the SIGOT call. Okay. That's it. Um, we want to leave some time for questions. I think we have a little bit of time. Um, there's links to where you can find us after today. Uh, we'd love to have you join and participate in the conversation and help out with some of these things. That's it. Thank you. I think there are microphones. So if you have a question, go to the microphone. That'll help the recording and help other people. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, uh, hello. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, quick question. Um, about the image pull auth, and you said it's on kind of a per pod thing. Is it, would pods that are part of the same deployment also continue doing that auth? Because that would affect cold starts. Uh, which, which of the two features are you talking about? The one that like re-verifies re access? Re-verification, yeah. Re-verification. Uh, so the re-verification um, is not pod specific. The re-verification looks at the credentials that are being used to pull the image, which today are just the static image yeah. pull secrets. And so that's what it pays attention to. It basically says uh, it takes a hash of the actual credential data, and it also looks at the dimension of the secret, like the name, namespace, UID. And it says if either of those were previously allowed to pull this image, then you're good. So if you have a bunch of pods from the same deployment using the same image pull secrets on the same node, only the first one is going to hit the registry. Okay, awesome. Thanks. 
Um, so that RBAC++ plus plus is pretty cool. Um, one question I noticed, in, unless I missed it, in your demo, you drilled in deep into the object uh, that you're requesting, but for the user, you were just testing the username. And I'm wondering if we can like, go into the labels that are on the user service account, if it's got any. Uh, so not the labels, but in the user. So basically, the user info is available. Uh, and then apart from that, the request attribute. So in that, the namespace name, the label selector, and the field selectors, that's what we are thinking of exposing right now. Yeah, so the way the authentication layer works uh, is that the authenticator returns a set of user attributes, username, some groups, and then some extra attributes. Uh, and so it's up to the authenticator to decide what goes in those extra attributes. Uh, and for service account authentication, things like the node and the pod are now surfaced as extra attributes. But you don't have access all the way back through to the service account API object and labels and stuff there. I see. OK. Nobody else. Everybody's ready to go home. All right. I think we'll call it there. Thank you all for coming out. Hope to see you later. Have a great trip home. See you.